Okay, thanks very much, Steve. Uh, can everyone hear me at the back? Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks very much for, for the introduction. Um, as Steve mentioned, I, uh, Tata Steel won the CIPR Inside Award uh, this year for the best internal newspaper and magazine, and uh, I've actually left a copy on your table so you can... Uh, some of you will be able to take it away, but you'll certainly be able to have a quick look at it uh, to see what it is we do. And, uh, of course, I brought the whole team along, although, uh, although there's five of us there, which is the whole team. Uh, internal communications isn't the mo major job for some of these people, um, but they all contribute in their own little way in terms of the balanced content. So um, it's great to represent the manufacturing industry, the often maybe unloved and uh, forgotten about part of uh, the PR industry, but there's a, there's a massive amount of work going on in the manufacturing industry, and I'm going to tell you a story about what we've been doing in Tata Steel. Uh, to support that. Um, and Steve mentioned the offline audience, and a part of that, which I'm going to focus on today, is about our newspaper. Uh, it's called The Journey in its original incarnation. The one you've got on your desk has, has changed its name, but it's the same vehicle. So this is a newspaper that we do for our business, which goes out to 5,000 employees in South Wales. It's 12 pages, and we do it every 10 working days. So as I said, we're a business, we're based in uh, South Wales in Portalba. It's a site that employs uh, four or 5,000 people across two sites, really, but I'm based in Portalba. Uh, it's a 13 square kilometre site. Most people don't get onto the site because it's, uh, it's heavily regulated. And so I thought it'd be interesting to try and share with you a bit about the context in which we're communicating with an offline audience. Um, which may be fo quite foreign to, to some of you, but as Steve mentioned, you know, we've got a lot of employees, I'm going I'm to talk you through a bit later on, uh, who don't have access to email, who don't have access to computers, who are, who are uh, remote workers, if you like. It's a shame that people can't come onto our site because actually we've got the largest private beach in Europe. You can see at the top of the site here. Um, that stretches from Kenfig down to Aberavon. Uh, it's a beautiful beach on a sunny day. And you can look out to sea, and then you can look back and see the hills behind us. And in between is a, is a 13 kilometer square steelworks. If you read our marketing literature, you'll see some fantastic photographs of Tata Steel and our operations. You'll see photographs like the, uh, the fabulous Land Rover Evoke. Land Rover being part of the Tata group, of course. Uh, you might see photographs like this of uh, part of our processes, beautifully lit. You might see photographs like this of people in uh, nice workwear with the gas monitors and properly uh, PPE'd up. If you do get onto our site, and uh, you know, occasionally we'll take people in on groups and visitors and schools and, uh, and VIPs, you see stuff like this. So our deep water harbour, one of the only ones in the UK. You see blast furnaces, iconic people driving along the M4 in South Wales say, I know I'm home when I see the blast furnaces of, of the steelworks. Uh, and you might see pictures like this, a steel plant where we're charging uh, liquid iron into the steel making vessels. And there's our hot mill. So you see lots of hot metal, lots of big industry. Five million tonnes a year of steel we make on a single site. What you don't tend to see very much of is people. So we've got 5,000 people, but in all reality, you know, 1,000 or 1,200 people of those will be office-based uh, staff. The rest of them are shift-based. We've got four shifts, so 3,500 people, three people over four shifts. You're like talking 500, 600 people per shift. And on a 13 square kilometre site, they're pretty few and far between. So those people who have this traditional uh, uh, vision of the steel industry and heavy industry, lots of people with big sticks, you know, working and sweating during the day, it just isn't like that anymore. When we have big investments such as this one, which was when we rebuilt the blast furnace in Patalba, it cost 200 million pounds. There's probably an extra thousand people on the site. And so you do see more people then. But again, they're an offline audience. They don't sit in offices in front of computers and emails. <coughs> you tend to see a lot of people like this. Now, for those of you, I'm not sure if everyone can see it, but you know, there's, a, there's a guy, and it'll be a team leader or a team member, and in front of him is a bank of screens. And so, you, so if a lot of our people are based in, in an environment like this, you say, well, what's the offline bit got to do with it? All the machines you'll see on there, all the screens you'll see on there are uh, process control machines, we call them. So those are the bits of kit that operate the plant. They don't have email. They don't have intranet. Their version of the intranet looks something like that, rather than that, which is the, the, the corporate one. So we've got a lot of people in our business. You know, and there's 14,000 in the UK, 24,000 uh, ac across Europe. 
Um, but there's a lot of our people who are in environments like this. This, this is a guy who, who drives a crane in the, in the harbour I showed you earlier, a glass-bottomed crane cab of 150 feet above the, the vessel. We've got a people who work in an environment like this. We've got people in an environment like this. This is the offline audience that we're trying to communicate to. Now, the written publication isn't very new in many industries, and it's certainly not very new in the steel industry. And I grabbed these uh, shots of some, uh, some old newspapers that, interestingly enough, we used to charge employees for. Um, <laughs> they were a penny each. Uh, so the one on the right, on, on your left there, is, uh, is from, I think, 1948. 1953, Ingot News, the dragon. You know, this, 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 the, the whole principle of, of targeting your audience is as relevant today as it was then. You know, the dragon. You couldn't get more Welsh than that, could you, for a, for a Welsh audience? You know, moving on to the 50s, the Steel Company of Wales, the bulletin newspaper, and into the 80s, Steel News. You know, the interesting thing is when you look back at some of these, uh, these publications, that the, the headlines don't actually seem to change very much over the generations. And although we haven't many, maybe had a strike uh, recently, when we had a recent uh, issue with our pensions, there was one that was being threatened. So, you know, you know real interesting history to some, of the, to some of the printed communications that we had in our organisation. And then this one for me is really interesting because I've been in the steel industry for 26 years, you know, although I did my degree in engineering, I've been in comms and PR and marketing pretty much all my career. And you live in a context and an environment uh, and sometimes it's very difficult to get out of that environment. So this is, uh, before Tata Steel we were Chorus and before Chorus we were British Steel, just to put it in context of, of where this sits as a Chorus publication. So this was our regular employee newsletter from probably 2000 to 2005, or 1998 to 2005. And it was an A4 glossy magazine. It was beautifully designed, external agency, paid for photography, great features in it, on brand, all the colours. We even went to the expense of sending it to people's homes in little poly-wrapped envelopes because... You know, as an industry, we're you know, very family-oriented. Lots of the employees in our business live very close to the works. Their fathers work there, their grandfathers work there. Everything around the industry is around the community. So, so the two are, are very much as one. So the idea of sending it to people's homes so that people's wives and children could understand what they're going through at work was a very strong one. And it cost a lot of money. But no one read it. It cost us a fortune. But no one read it. And do you know what the worst thing that worse than the worse than the fact that no one read it? We knew no one read it. <laughs> but we were in an environment where, you know, my my appraisal form probably said publish six editions of Chorus News every year. And every year I got a big fat tick. Woo! And I knew no one read it. And yet I carried on regardless. And some, you know, I think as internal communicators, we have to remember that we're doing this for a reason. And that reason isn't to put a tick box in our appraisal forms. That reason you know, isn't so we can say, oh, I've done some magazines or some newsletters or internet sites. Our reason is to affect change in the organisation. And sometimes that change uh, it becomes more poignant. So in 2005, everything changed. And this happened. So, as I say, I've been 26 years in the steel industry, and it's, uh, it's never an industry, easy industry to be in. In 2005, in South Wales, we had two fatal accidents within the space of six weeks of each other. So two people came to work and didn't go home to their families. And it's tough. It's tough for the industry. It's tough for the people who live there. It becomes like a family, the steel industry. And, you know, to have someone, even if you don't know them, but within that family who suffers an accident at work and dies as a result of it, it's massively uh, cha changes the, the organisation. Although we've got a, a very sad and long history of, of such incidents, it's really a very, very difficult time for your organisation. And then, so what happened in 2005 is we had a, a new director came in, managing director, who said... You know, we can go and look at this investigation and we can change the incident and, and, and the environment in which these accidents happen. But actually, the root cause of some of this stuff is the shit at the bottom of the organisation. You know, the little few things that happen at the top, the fatal accidents, you can go and fix those. 
But unless you, unless, you, unless you change the culture of the organization, unless you change all the shit at the bottom, you're actually not going to change the bit at the top. And so everything changed in the organization. And so for a number of years, I'd been sitting in a communications function which had been rather peripheral to the organization, and we'd been allowed to go along and do our little things in our corner in our office. And uh, my manager at the time, I remember, said to me, he said, what is it we can do to make you a happier employee in Tata Steel, or Chorus, as it was at the time? And I said to him, I just wish someone cared about what I did. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden, someone really cared about what I did. Because the organisation, which was then saying, we have to change. If we want to stop killing people in our organisation, we've got to really change. And we have to change everything we do. And we have to change the aspect of everything we do. And if you don't think communications is part of that, you've missed out a big time. Communication is absolutely fundamental. It has to make a difference to the organisation. We cannot just go and tick some boxes. So careful what you wish for, you might just get it. Because our employees, who are largely look like this, <coughs> average age 42, average length of service 17 years, 80% of them live within five miles of the plant. These people aren't being communicated to. All they're getting is a magazine in a poly envelope at home that they don't read because it doesn't talk to them. It's not their language. It's corporate. It's jargon-filled. It's not relevant. And so that was our challenge. And so we had a business consultant in at the time, don't we all? Uh, and, uh, and they borrow your wristwatch and tell you what time it is. Um, apologies to the consultants in the room. Um, he said to us, oh, we need a newspaper. It's like, yeah, of course we do, yeah, newspaper, yeah, we can do that, can we? And he had this expression, and he used to say, whether you believe you can do something or whether you believe you can't do something, you're probably right. And I was like, brilliant, oh, tweet, that. that's brilliant, awesome, <laughs> great. He was wrong, and that expression is wrong, because when he said what he needs is a newspaper, I 100% didn't believe we could do it. No chance. I said, well, we might be able to do an A4 two-sider, you know, if we're lucky, drag up some stories. But he kept on, he kept on, he kept on, he kept on, and eventually we did a bit of research and we looked into it and we found a local print and design company who did something similar for, a, for a Swansea University, as it turns out. And uh, back in 2006, we produced our first newspaper. Woo! Uh, and it was eight pages, which was a revelation, but it was tabloid, and it looks very much like the one you've got on your paper today, on, on your tables today. Um, record breakers, eight pages of news, and uh, you know it's funny looking back on it because it was, although it was meant to be designed by the people for the people, it was one of those you know, uh, when you look at it and you read it, you go, it was pretty pretty close to the mark because it's not very good. Um, <laughs> you're talking about you know we're all content creators these days. You, know, you wouldn't want to go back to those days, I think. But there we are. So it was eight pages, tw uh, eight pages of, of content, and the idea was that this newspaper was supposed to reflect. Uh, what's going on in the organisation. So whilst, you know, an offline audience, you can have team briefs and you can have manager briefings and so forth, this newspaper was really designed to reflect the values of the organisation, to, to, to be much more open about behaviours and standards and the, and the goals of the organisation, and to create a, a language for the organisation, if you like, which re reinforced the vision of, uh, you know, as it turned into cr creating a sustainable steel industry in Wales. Someone said earlier, Steve, or Rachel said earlier about what is it that people care about? And in the steel industry in South Wales, it, you know, it's been around for 100 years and it's created entire societies. It's become you know, iconic in the, in the fabric of society in, in Wales. And so sustaining that steel industry in Wales, which is under threat when you start killing people and you know, pissing off your customers and so forth, then sustaining that steel industry in Wales becomes massively important. And that's what people care about. And Rachel's absolutely right. Tap into what people care about and then that help them to understand what it is that they can do to, to, to sustain that industry. So ten working days later, we had another newspaper popped out. And it's like, well, I miss, you know, I didn't believe we could do this, and all of a sudden it looks like maybe we can after all. This is back in 2006. And it's funny when you, when you juxtaposition those two headlines, you know, record breakers one week, setback the next. I'll tell you, nothing changes in the steel industry. It's just like that these days. Um, and here we are, issue three was the first one we did 12 pages, so that was uh, January, I think, Christmas to January 2006, 7, 12 pages. And here we are nine years later, 
Uh, I think we're on edition 209 or something. And it's been going out every 10 working days. And so I'm going to now talk you through a bit about how we do that and what's important to us, what works and maybe what doesn't work. This whole change in the organisation, however, did create something which helped a lot. It created a call for openness and honesty, often brutally. You know, if we were to change an organisation which was having accidents that ended up in people not going home at the end of the day, the thing we didn't need was to start hiding stuff. We didn't need to start hiding behaviours and standards and the activities that people were doing. We need to be open about it. And so we did. Uh, so here was an early uh, front page where um, a guy was going in and taking all his teams, clocking in and out cards, and just clocking them in and out. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Clocking his whole team in and out, whether they were in or work or not. Um, and we caught him on CCTV camera, and then we published it. Because what we're saying to the rest of the workforce is, I remember the hub director at the time saying to me, we want the good people to know there's other good people out there. And I want the bad people to know that other bad people are being caught. Have a bit of that. <laughs> the danger is, you know, what well, someone was on Twitter this week about uh, the great internal comms myths. There's no such thing as internal communications. Yeah, I understand that. So there's a real risk of putting some of this stuff on your, on your newspaper. 5,000 copies of it sprayed willy-nilly across the site. There's a real danger of that going outside. And what does that do for your brand? You know, do, do people outside the business go, Christ, what, what sort of organisation has got people like this in it? Or do they actually say, here is an organisation that we know its history of who's seriously trying to change itself. And it's doing it so seriously, it's going to be really, really, really open about it. Because we took the latter approach. And part of that change was to engage with those external audiences saying, if some of this shit ends up in the local newspaper, let me explain why. Let me explain the context for it. Some a word again, I think Rachel used, the context. Let me explain the context of this. We're trying to change our business and we can't do it if we're not open and honest with stuff. So if you read in the newspaper, hey, we'll take it, but you now understand why. Politicians, the media themselves, customers, suppliers, community leaders. We're trying to change our organisation. So interestingly, uh, and here's a great example, the CEO of the local authority came to visit and have a discussion about our change programme and so forth. And he rocked up at the works and decided there was nowhere to park, so he parked on the double yellow lines. <laughs> so not only did we clamp him in line with our values and behaviours, we wrote a story about it and put it in our paper. <laughs> you know, what better way than to say, you know, we are not going to target you because you're a team member who parks on yellow lines. Whoever you are, we are going to become intolerant of these behaviours. Now, intolerance is a difficult word um, because it has some negative connotations. But when there's people, you know, if, you get to the, if you get to the place where you accept that small behaviours can create culture and the, and the consequences of those small behaviours may be things like fatal accidents, then you must be intolerant of behaviours. And the communications was the route to, 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 to share those behaviours, reinforce them and be open and critical about them. And this is one that was a great example. So, content is king. Again, Rachel, I think, mentioned it. Content is king. Uh, so, so, I guess you're sitting there saying, how the hell do you fill 12 pages of content every 10 working days? And I put that cartoon in there, and I know it's rather crass, but we... My speaker note said we beg. Uh, and it, it's kind of true. You know, it's about relationships. So, you know, you, content has to come from somewhere. We're a small team, and getting those um, fingers into the organisation to find out what's happening in every aspect of our organisation, whether it's operationally, commercially, in terms of our people, agenda, values, behaviours, examples, you've got to build a really, really strong network. And you need those people to trust you, to tell you the good stories and the bad stories. There's some stuff that goes without saying, and you may not be able to read this at the back, but it's kind of the standard content. So the director's saying, listen, I can write something for you every week, or I can guide you every week, whether we write it or not. We've got a works chaplain. I bet, hands up if anyone here has got a works chaplain. Excellent. Now, I'm, I'm not a religious person, but having a works chaplain is a fantastic thing for an organisation. It provides a... 
you know, not only is he a trained counsellor, but it provides a conscience to the organisation, it provides a very different, different angle in the organisation. Um, and so there's someone who's able to bring a different angle to our communications that may touch some different people than the managing director's column reaches. So. There's some standard content. We've got a community programme in South Wales that provides us content. There's all sorts of stuff going on in the industry. So there's some standard content which helps us go through. The other thing we do is try and align it to our strategic themes. Ah, oh, no, you're all, this is the boring bit. And, and it kind of is because, you know, most of our employees aren't interested in strategic themes. But the thing about internal comms is it has two things to do. You know, people say, you know, what you need to do is write about stuff that people are interested in. Okay, but writing about the bonus only goes so far. And it's really difficult to say, we have a responsibility and employees have a responsibility. They're being paid to be an employee. They're being paid to be directed. They're being paid to uh, do not only the work to the best of their ability, but the, the, the right work. Choose the right things as well. And therefore, it's the responsibility of the organisation to help them understand what those right things are. So it's not just what people want to hear. It's what the business wants them to hear as well. And so we do try and follow strategic themes of the organisation. This is quite a complex graph, and, and, it, and it's only there as a picture rather than for detail. But if, you, if, we, if we're trying to create content and, we, and we're struggling to know where to go, we just look to the strategic themes and go, hey, we haven't had anything about customers or the environment or health and safety. Go and find someone and say what's happening in that world. Because in an organisation of 5,000 people, there will be something happening. Our trick then is to turn that into something that's interesting. Uh, never that, still keeping an eye on the time. Never that truth gave away a good story. I was funny when um, Sarah stood up. <laughs> I was feeling slightly nervous when she said about these, you know, these ethics and all that, and never let the truth go away of a good story, because I've got a couple of great examples here, maybe how it shouldn't be done. Never let the truth go away of a good story. It's a, it's a, it's a byline that, that I use with people in our organisation, which is mostly engineers, um, because they want to tell you the detail, you know? That's, I've got a great story for your newspaper, and 3,000 words. <sighs> and it's all technical. It's like, ugh, I don't... I don't, I don't need that version of the truth. I, just, I want a story. Storytelling should be a lot about what today is about. So when we do hear stories, we go, fantastic, what a great story. Sensationalist, you know, the journalist in you comes out. And this was a very briefly, this was a story about a guy who'd driven his uh, truck into the crash barrier. He, he was on the phone or doing something or other. Smashed the windscreen. And, and in, in order to avoid detection, he'd gone and got a brick, thrown it through the windscreen. and said, oh, I was driving along and a brick fell off and smashed my windscreen. <laughs> That's, uh, and this is, you know, this is pure gold. When you're trying to reinforce values and behaviours, this is pure gold. Crush test dummy. What a fantastic piece of news. Of course, you know, when it was investigated, what turned out is he had actually driven into the barrier, but he was living in a culture of fear with his own line manager that he was so frightened to report it that he had to make something up. Which is a much more powerful story about some bloke who, you know, took his eye off the ball and crashed into a post. So that truth and good story sometimes... Um, the, 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 tr the, 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 the reality is the, is the better and the stronger story, even, even if it's not so sensational. I couldn't resist putting this one in. My favourite story in nine years. We heard this story about, uh, on the site, it's, as I said, 13 square kilometre site. Someone has seen a gritter going round the site roads. Uh, and closely following the gritter was a road sweeper. <laughs> you couldn't make it up. Now, so we published it. <laughs> hey, what the hell? The uh, site facilities manager was less than happy when he read the story because <laughs> he wanted proof, and of course we didn't have any. It did serve, I don't know whether it's true to this day, but I love the story, but it did serve the purpose about getting people to question what we're doing. Are we joined up in an organisation? So. And then never let the good story away in the tr get in the way of the truth. So again, another quick story about consultants. So... Uh, steel industry was struggling for money and so we were on a big cost saving bend and McKinsey came in and said oh you need to do something really notable and iconic to show that demonstrate that we're all in this together and we're going to save money so you should print your newspaper in black and white yeah okay we've done it before we'll do it again okay if it makes you happy fine black and white but the truth is it didn't cost any less to do it in black and white than it did in colour so yeah let's print it in black and white but let's put a story in that says, you've probably noticed this newspaper's in black and white and it probably made you stop and think about costs. Fantastic, that's what it's meant to do. But the truth is, actually, it didn't cost any less. 
honest and open. And then it's not just about what you say, it's how you say it. So, uh, <laughs> again, this, you know, this level of honesty gave us, you know, this by the people, for the people philosophy gave us a great license to come up with some fantastic headlines. And this was, uh, we have an on-site occupational health, they were doing some flu vaccines. You know, wh wh why wouldn't you put that headline in there? Oh, <laughs> uh, because we're a big corporate, you know, oh, it's a bit disrespectful and it's a bit... No, it's not. People love it. Why would you not stop on that page and read that article? Because we're all human beings. We all think it's funny. It's pathetic, I know, but we all do. It drags us in. Just a little prick. And then, of course, it's not just about what you say, it's about how you present it. And so, for a number of years, in the early editions of the Journey newspaper, I was, I was frustrated that it never quite looked like a newspaper. And I'm not a newspaper designer, so I couldn't tell a designer what was wrong with it. Uh, and eventually, I got in touch with Media Wales uh, in Cardiff, and I said... I want our newspaper to look like the Western Mail, because I love the Western Mail. It's a great, the National Newspaper of Wales, they call it. It's a great newspaper. It's really well laid out. I really like it. I want it to look like that. And he said, no, you don't. I said, yes, I do. He said, no, you don't. I do. He said, you want it to look like that, which is the South Wales Echo, because the Western Mail is aimed at ABCs, and the Echo isn't. It's the CDEs. He said, your workforce, read the Echo, you read the Western Mail, but your workforce read the Echo. And he was absolutely spot on. The same happened to me when um, ITV came on site and the Carol Green, the correspondent, said, why do you always let the BBC onto your site first? I'm like, well, hey, they're the BBC, what do you expect? He said, yeah, but your workforce watch ITV. She was right. She was absolutely right. So think about the audience. You know, try not to get caught in your own uh, paradigm. So the newspaper, as I said, it's been going for nine years and it's been hard work and it's like Groundhog Day, but it, it can't be that bad because everyone else has copied us since. <laughs> so everybody in Tartar Steel Europe has their own newspaper and they all look pretty similar. Uh, the branding thing's another issue for another day because it's kind of gone away from it by the people, for the people. But in the mouth in Holland, in Germany, uh, France, in Turkey, all over Europe people are doing newspapers because it works for our audience, it works. To the extent that a guy I used to have working for me, who used to edit the newspaper, left and joined Welsh Water. <laughs> <laughs> Rock on. Um, so we've talked about content, we've talked about messaging, we've talked about design and layout. Um, but the other thing is, I'd say, is it's worth nothing if no one gets to see it. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'll tell this very quick story, because I think it's indicative of the organisation we are. In an organisation of 5,000 people, especially in heavy industry, you have a number of people who are on sick and long-term sick. As part of our HR processes, we, have, um, we try to get those long people on long-term sick back into the organisation by bringing them back on light duties and so forth. And uh, this is a guy called Neil, and Neil's uh, been off work for a long time with some uh, heart issues, but he's come back into the organisation, he's on light duties. And one of the things that we can use these people for then is to deliver our newspapers around the site. So they know our site, they know our people, they know where to go, and it's a great way of uh, using our people so it's not costing us anything extra, bringing them back into the organisation, getting them back into work, and, uh, and, and getting some sense of worth from what they're doing. So distribution is massively important because if we're not careful, we spend all our time creating the content and, we, and then we just fling it out to the four, four, four winds and, and don't know where it goes. So just in wrapping up, you know, we've covered everything, warts and all, so I've talked about the fatal accidents, but... You know, it's successes and failures. It's all gone in there, the good and the bad. It's brutally honest, brutally honest. But uh, um, it has to be because of the nature of our organisation. You've seen the other newspapers around Europe and, and how we're sharing stuff now. So we have a joint editorial call, we share content, we have campaigns that go through all the newspapers. They're all lined up in terms of their timing. Some stuff to learn. Remember your audience I've talked a lot about. It's a newspaper for a reason. It's not a feature. It's not a magazine. It's a newspaper. News, the clues in the word. It's newspaper. Um, and if it's boring, guess what? If it's boring you, if, and I do this all the time, you know, I've 20 years of my career have been trained to kind of roar right the corporate jargon and know that it's going to go through because no one's going to be upset by it. But sometimes you read something, that's just boring. It's just boring. I'm not interested in it. I know if I'm not interested, I guarantee no one else is. So leave it out. Design's a, it's a science, I'm learning. It's a, a design is massively important to the way this stuff is so soaked in. 
And then the bit about capability, you know, and I love this, this Thomas Mann quote, a writer is someone for whom writing is more difficult than it is for other people. Do not underestimate the power of writing skills. It is absolutely massive in printed publications and, and online. So is it all worth it? So we did an you know, employee survey, and when we asked people what their favourite form of communication was, 77% of people said the newspaper. 77% of people said the newspaper. They like it, because maybe it's got puzzles and competitions in it. But even in terms of when they understand what's happening most about the business, it's still 33%. So it's still a very, very important, it's not the only, but it's a very important way of communicating with the audience. Which is just as well. It's just as well that it's starting to have an effect. Because when this happened, so this was 2007, and someone else died on our site. You need to be damn sure that what you're doing every day is making a difference. And maybe the next slide is maybe the most powerful of all in terms of what communications can do for an organisation, and clearly it's not down to communications alone. But if you look at the safety record of my organisation since we started this change programme and this communications, you can see what's happened. This is lost time accidents per million man hours. It's standard measure of safety. If you are communicating to really change the organisation, you can do it. Communications is massively powerful. Do not underestimate it. It's probably, I think, as, as Rachel Steve said earlier, one of the most powerful tools an organisation has is its internal communications. And here we are, edition 2209, 2009, it feels like it. Uh, it's on your paper, uh, it's on your desk, and uh, like I say, it's every 10 working days, so tomorrow we're going to do it all over again. Thank you very much.